So welcome everybody to another conversation with Dr. Maggie Ellis. Um, I'm absolutely delighted that we've got, if, if you've not seen the first one, don't worry, it's a bit like Star Wars. You don't need to have known the first one. You can pick up the story so that that will be, that'll work out fine. Um, my name is Emma Smith. I'm the project manager with Empowered Conversations, which is an Age UK Salford project. Um, welcome everyone. We've got a really nice audience today, Maggie. We have got people affected by dementia, we've got some empowered colleagues on, we've got some academics, we've got some NHS folk, and then we've got a load of practitioners as well. So real nice mix of people Great. joining us. And as always, we'll record this and we'll put it on YouTube so people can refer to it and they can share it out with colleagues as well. Um, Fantastic. So today's plan is a little bit of an intro from me, and then I'm gonna hand over to Maggie, who's gonna have a chat with us. Um, and then we're going to have a QA and a at the, at the end. If you haven't been on before, the Q&A function is just at the bottom. So if at any point there's a question you want to ask, just write it in there and then we will pick it up at the end. We'll make sure we've got a good 15, maybe 20 minutes, depending on how much Maggie talks, of time to go through q 15 minutes. We'll definitely have 15 <laughs> minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, so as I said, I work for Age UK, um, Salford, we deliver communication courses across Greater Manchester for family carers of people with dementia. We also offer one-to-one -one support in Salford um, through a project called Empowered Carers. And as a result of COVID, we have been doing a lot more online stuff. So we have groups, uh, we have a singing group. I'm just saying that because Barbara and Margaret are on. We have an amazing singing group called Come and Sing Every Friday. We have a disco. We have support groups and we have these webinars. And Maggie, this is our 30th webinar that we've done in the last year. Congratulations. <laughs> they haven't got any better. Well, the, the speakers have got better. <laughs> I've not got any better. But... <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's who we are. So I think, yeah, that's all I need to say. So at any point, just, just pop your questions down at the bottom and I am going to hand over to Maggie now and sit back and enjoy. Thank you very much. Right, let me just share my screen, Emma. And share sound. Okay. Can everybody see that? Can everyone see? Yeah. I can't hear anyone. Oh, sorry. You can only hear me, Maggie. And I have my thumb up. Sorry, you can't see me either, can you? Right. Yes. Yes, okay. I okay, right. Thanks very much. Now, first of all, I have to share um, some information with you all. It's just between us. Um, of course, no one else is going to see this. Um, I lost a front tooth at the weekend on Saturday night when I was eating pizza. So I have a tooth missing here. And I had to tell my great niece and nephew that I had... Uh, started a new career as a pirate. Um, so I'm currently waiting to have something done with this. So uh, apparently you don't see it too much when I talk, but if I smile with a big open mouth, as I tend to, um, you will see a great big gap. So if I smile with my mouth closed and laugh with my mouth closed, that is why um, I don't want to frighten the mice, okay? Let's carry on. Okay, so thanks very much for having me back again. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today. I wish I had a full set of teeth um, to share with you, but unfortunately, you know, then's the breaks, that's life. Um, I'm really delighted to be back again. I've got lots of really interesting uh, findings and progression to share with you. Uh, so last time uh, we spoke, I gave you a little introduction to adaptive interaction. And I spoke about the early research that kind of underpins where we are now, uh, which is really the story of the approach, kind of where it came from and where we've been and where we're going is what we're going to talk about today. OK, so this time, I'm going to show you some more filmed examples of adaptive interaction uh, being performed. And the clip 
think the reason, one of the reasons I was asked to come back is because I couldn't find the clip that I wanted to show you the last time um, that we just discussed off the, off the top of our heads. But I have it this time, so I have the clip that um, I'm going to make you all wait till the end though. Um, so I'm going to give you an update of where we are in the research and I'm also going to talk about our future directions. Okay, so if we go back just briefly to the previous research, what did our early research in adaptive interaction tell us? Well, it told us that the approach has potential for improving quality of life, quality of communication and interactions for people with advanced dementia. Uh, and in the early research, we saw increases in engagement when people with advanced dementia were taking part in adaptive interaction sessions. So we saw increases in smiling in vocalizing and in imitation. So of course, I was engaging in imitation of the person with dementia, but what you also saw was more imitation of the person with dementia imitating me, which we found really, really interesting. We weren't necessarily expecting to see that. And of course, all these little um, parts of communication are the fundamentals of communication and are part of our nonverbal vocabulary. Uh, and it's the kind of communication we engage in before we develop speech, but we retain those skills throughout our lives and rely on them um, as much as we do with uh, verbal communication. So we also found that adaptive interaction provides us with a way to learn the individual language of each person with advanced dementia. So I think I said last time there are similarities in, in how people communicate, but each person has their own little repertoire of communicative actions that they engage in. And the last main point there about the early research is we showed that staff members uh, can learn how to use the approach and that they find it useful in daily care, which we found really encouraging because I think I said the last time that we did struggle initially to engage care staff in this approach um, for, for several different reasons. And when people tried it and found that they got something from it um, and that they could use it in daily care, then we really started to see a shift in, in people's attitudes. So that was really encouraging finding for us. So where did we go next? After that very early work uh, with the single case study and the first staff training programme, we conducted what's called a small n study. Now, small n just means small number. Um, so there were only five people in this study, but it allowed us to uncover the individual communicative repertoires of each of these five individuals. If you're interested in reading about it, there's a paper that I can direct you to um, from 2017 when we published this work. So what, what did we do in this study? Each person took part in uh, six sessions. So these were adaptive interaction sessions and standard sessions. So like I mentioned the last time, the speech-based interactions. And each person took part in both different kinds. And these responses to the uh, adaptive interaction and the, spe the speech based interactions were coded on the videotape. So we videotaped everything. We did a micro analysis of all the communicative actions that were occurring on the videotape and we compared between the two different types of session. So I'm gonna show you a video now of Gisela. And Gisela was one of the participants in this study. And you'll notice that she's very, very different from Edie, uh, the lady we met last time, and from John, the, the gentleman that you met last time. Uh, again, Edie, like John, is very quiet. 
but she does have a different set of communicative actions that she engages in. And this is again a very subtle um, video. So do try and see if you can hear what's going on here and just watch what she's doing in response to me. So again, this is me talking to her. Are you well today? Have you had lunch? Did you enjoy your meal? Okay, so I hope you agree that there, there isn't very much going on there at all. Um, Gisela is very interested in her hand, so she's looking at her hand a lot, and she does look up at me occasionally. She is interested, I think, on a uh, on a level but because I don't meet her where she is and I don't give her anything that she can understand or engage with she, she disengages from me and again if you saw the last time you'll understand why we use the questions that we did and why there's a gap in between and why I appear to be looking at my phone um, is to time the gaps between the questions so that they're consistent. But if you want to know more about that type of interaction, then do watch the first, uh, the first webinar that we did. So not very much going on there at all. Uh, in the next video, you will see me uh, attempting to use Gisela's non-verbal communicative repertoire to engage her. Um, let's see what you think of this next one. There's just so much going on in that video. I wish I could talk to you, actually. Is it possible to have people put their mics on, Emma? No, not on a webinar, Maggie, sorry. Oh, okay, never mind, never mind. At the end, we can, we can hopefully, I'll yeah. answer some of your questions. Okay, so as I said, it is, um, it's quite subtle what you see here, but the differences between this session and the previous one are huge. Um, not only is Gisela taking my hand unprompted, 
Uh, she is pulling herself closer to me. She is looking straight into my eyes. She laughs, she smiles. She makes movements and then looks back at me to see if I'm watching or if I'm doing the same thing. There's so much going on in this video. Um, I think it's a great example because it isn't loud and rowdy. You know, it's very, very quiet, but we can still see a lot going on with this video. So this is just an example of um, one person who took part in the small end study. And it's an example of, of parts of two of her sessions um, that I think illustrate the, the findings quite well. Okay. So as I mentioned to you, uh, we did a micro analysis of the, the videotapes, uh, which involves a very long and laborious task of looking at all the different types of communicative actions that every person engages in. So we've got things like eye gaze, gestures, uh, facial expressions, movements. You can see on the right there, there are all sorts of uh, behaviours that people engage in. And there's the reference there, the 2017 reference, if you're interested in reading more about it. So what we saw were that the adaptive, inter uh, adaptive interaction sessions were characterised by significantly more smiling on the part of the person with dementia, significantly more looking at me as the interaction partner, more vocalization, so more sounds were made and attempts at words were made during adaptive interaction, and more imitation of the communication partner, so me. Um, the person with dementia imitated me more often in these sessions, which was, and again, we found this just so encouraging that we could see um, changes between the two different types of session. Uh, and the findings really told us that adaptive interaction has this real potential uh, as a basis for re-engaging people with dementia um, who are at a stage where they can no longer talk and understand speech, finding a way of re-engaging them in a social world somehow. So the next study, uh, a couple of years ago, excuse me just a second, The next study uh, was a much larger study. And I had two master's students working on this project as well. Uh, and we recruited 32 people living with advanced dementia uh, from care homes all across Fife and Tayside and Angus. So it was, although it's only 32 people, it was really, it's really challenging to recruit people um, with very advanced dementia. Uh, so I think we, we did fairly well um, in terms of recruitment. And again, we used the standard interaction, adaptive interaction, and we also included a control condition in this study, which really just means we didn't do anything at all with the person. We sat with the person and filmed them. Uh, so we had 10 people in standard interaction, 12 in adaptive interaction, and 10 in the control. And this was done at random. And what was really exciting about this study is that we wanted to see if there were any physiological responses to engaging in adaptive interaction for the person with dementia. Uh, so I worked with a colleague at the School of Psychology and Neuroscience, uh, Gail Doherty, who was able to give us resources and, and train the students how to analyse saliva samples. So when I went into the care homes and did the sessions, I would take a pre-session saliva sample from the person with dementia, one directly after, and another one four hours later to see if there was any difference or if there was any hold of any effect. So this was extremely exciting to us because we, we'd never done anything like this before. And what we were looking for in the saliva samples were cortisol levels. So cortisol is the stress hormone. So we hypothesized that we might see a dip in cortisol in adaptive interaction sessions. If the person's being listened to and seen and heard, then we would expect that stress levels might dip. 
We also wanted to look at oxytocin. Um, and there's, there's so much information out there now about oxytocin. That's known as the, the cuddle hormone. And it increases when we experience feelings of connection with another person. Um, and we wanted to see if oxytocin rebel, uh, levels would rise um, after adaptive interaction sessions. So this was really super exciting. The first time I'd ever tried anything like this. And of course, it involved me going around all these care homes, collecting a lot of saliva samples, uh, getting them into the freezer as quickly as possible, uh, engaging in all these different types of interaction sessions. It was, it was, uh, it was challenging. It was really challenging time, but so worth it. So we also videotaped the interactions um, because that is an, an, an invaluable resource. Uh, it's, it's so good to have these records. And in terms of behavioural analysis, what we found was that, again, adaptive interaction increases engagement levels in people with advanced dementia, in particular behavioural interactions with me. And we also found that the participants not only reciprocated social exchanges from me, so they replied to me, to my communicative bids and however they found possible, but we also found that they were able to initiate them uh, in response to adaptive interaction, which was, again, a really exciting finding for us. What wasn't so exciting and quite disappointing, to be honest, was that the saliva analysis didn't work for us. Um, we couldn't get enough um, of a sample from participants to be able to analyze oxytocin and cortisol. Um, we were able to get some data from the, uh, from the saliva, but not what we had initially planned. Um, but, you know, that's what happens in research. It, things go wrong, uh, things don't go to plan. So you just have to move on to the next step. And the next step for us is, is plan B, uh, which I will talk to you about in just a second. So we still have the saliva samples. They're still in a freezer. They, they haven't been wasted. We're gonna try something else with them, which is really just a wave of my head. <laughs> okay. So the next steps in our research are, we are looking to conduct a project that will be funded by the Life Changes Trust, looking at adaptive interaction in care homes uh, in Scotland. So we will be recruiting four care homes. Uh, two of the care homes will engage in adaptive interaction training and practice, and the other two care homes will serve as controls and will engage in typical normal care. And we want to look at the differences for people with dementia, for family members and for staff members. So we want to look at the impact on all three uh, stakeholders in this research, um, because it's something that if we were to try further to get this approach out there and being used, we need to be able to show that there is benefit for everyone. Uh, so that's the hope. Of course, that was funded last year. So I should have started this project last March, but for obvious reasons, um, I wasn't able to. I wasn't able to recruit anyone uh, to collect the data uh, or recruit any of the care homes or participants. Um, because there was no one going in and out of care homes at that point. And we are still currently on hold with this project. Um, I'm hoping that maybe by next year, we'll be able to go in and, and conduct this research because we're just, we're so excited to make a start. Another thing, well, quite a fortunate thing actually that, that's, that's happened uh, in the last year from all this lockdown business and not being able to travel is that we found ways of delivering our adaptive interaction training for professional care caregivers online. So we have now done uh, three introduction to adaptive interaction whole day training sessions online um, with care staff and all sorts of different professionals from all over the UK. And that seems to be working really well. 
Um, it's not the same as being able to be there in person and, and actually talk to people. Um, but it is, it is working and it's a good alternative, I think, to be able to talk to people in person. So that has been going on in the last year. Um, another really exciting thing that's about to start on Friday is a, a collaboration between myself and um, Professor Arlene Estelle, um, who is my collaborator on this work, and Empowered Conversations team. Um, I will be delivering a four week course to family caregivers of people with advanced dementia online. It will all be done online. And I will be teaching them how to engage in adaptive interaction. And there will also be a research element of this project as well. So we'll be doing some before and after questionnaires um, for caregivers as to how they found it, how they find that they have maybe their communication style has changed, how the person that they care for maybe has changed in terms of how the carer views their communication skills. So I'm, I'm super excited to start that on Friday. Um, I really hope I have a tooth by then so that I can uh, have a big smile and laugh out loud. Um, but I'll, I'm so excited to be starting that. Um, this is the first time that we'll have done any sort of formal training of uh, non-professional, uh, informal caregivers uh, of people with advanced dementia. So it really is a, a gift for us to be able to work with this group of people. And we're, we're just so grateful to Empower Conversations and delighted to be making a start. The last bullet point there says laser beams, exclamation mark. Now, the laser beams are what the plan B is for the saliva samples. Apparently, I don't know how it's done, but there is a, there's a chap who works in physics in University of St Andrews who is able to point laser beams at the saliva samples and take readings of oxytocin and cortisol. It, it's beyond my ken, but I am absolutely delighted to get something like that uh, happening between the schools. So my friend Gail uh, and this colleague from uh, physics are working together on a grant proposal to try and get some funding to employ someone uh, to take part in this uh, analysis. So that's again, you know, not something I ever expected to happen, but um, delighted that it's, that it's on the cards anyway. Um, you'll see on the right there, this is a conversation that we had at the uh, Empowered Conversations team where we spoke about the possibility of me running these training courses um, for uh, informal carers and now it's going to happen. So um, yeah, fantastic stuff. So this is the part you've all been waiting for, I reckon. Um, the last time we met, I mentioned to you that uh, adaptive interaction has been used with people who also have speech. And I wanted to show you this video of Jim because he has completely changed the way I feel about adaptive interaction and who we should be using it with. So my initial thoughts on the approach were, if a person can still talk, uh, and still able to engage in some sort of some sort of conversation, then we, sh the, we should be using their highest form of communication skills. So we should be attempting to engage the person using their conversational skills. And at the time, I didn't think it was necessarily appropriate to use this sort of approach with someone who could still talk. However, uh, Jim really changed my mind on this one. Uh, the story of how I came to know Jim is when I was recruiting for the previous study that I just spoke to you about, you know, the 32 participants. And I was in a care home in Dundee and I was chatting to the, the manager about recruiting and I was just standing in the doorway with my hand on the door frame and I heard this... Bang, 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 bang. I thought, what 
is that? And I said to the manager, what is that? And she said, oh, it's, it's Jim. Jim's in the room next door and he's banging on the table. So I pushed the door open a little bit. I asked them if it was okay. I pushed the door open and he started banging again on the table. And I started tapping on the door frame uh, in response to this. And we had this little conversation um, together and we hadn't recruited Jim to the study because he can talk. He was able to have a very basic conversation. He was quite deaf and almost completely blind, but this appealed to him for some reason. So what I want to show you now is after a, a video that I took after I got permission to work with Jim um, from his uh, closest family member. Uh, it's just a fantastic video. It's, it's quite long. It's about five minutes, but I'd, I'd like to show you the whole thing um, because I'd like you to see how Jim takes the lead on this completely. Now there's lots of turn taking here, there's lots of backwards and forwards, but he is the boss in this, absolutely. And I am following his lead and I'm trying to keep up with him. And you will see at several points during this interaction, he does try to test me. So he goes quicker and slower and he changes what he does um, to see if I can keep up with him. And I try, I, I don't always manage, but it became, a game to him uh, and a game for both of us and it was really enjoyable it really it tickled me um, that he would enjoy something like this that someone who could engage in speech could also enjoy this and although he was able to talk he preferred this type of interaction because I did try to talk to him and he would respond a couple of times but then he would just start playing this game again so I'm going to play the video now. As I said, it is quite a long video, but I think it's it's worthwhile uh, watching all the way through. So this is Jim. getting faster, daring me to speed up. He's getting softer. Just when I think he stopped. <laughs> That's my favourite bit. <laughs> He's changing the modality there. <laughs> oh, change it up again.
think that's the end. Yes, it is. <laughs> I was concentrating so much there that I've gone past the end. So I think you'll uh, agree, I hope you agree, that uh, Jim is completely in control of that session uh, and really, really put me to the test. And it was so much fun. At the end of um, that session, what I thought was the end, um, he had stopped for a couple of minutes and I'd been talking to him and I went to put my equipment away and stand up and I said that I was getting ready to go and just as I was about to go out the door he knocks on the table again he wanted me to come back and carry on so I did uh, okay so that's our website address if you're interested in learning more about adaptive interaction that's our book there on the right if you're interested in reading more about it all our publications are there as well we also do training um, if you're interested in learning how to engage in this in your workplace or in the home. So I'd like to thank you very much uh, for listening again today. Uh, I'm sorry to subject you to my uh, gappy smile, um, but thanks very much. That was brilliant. Thank you, Maggie. I've decided I think you need to be more six year old. Six year old, yeah. Mind. yeah. Six year old wouldn't be bothered about a tooth missing. They'd be happy. Mm -hmm. They'd be thinking, I could put, put a straw Probably. in there. Mm -hmm. Look, spaghetti <laughs> through there, you know. So maybe just a little bit more six year old. That shouldn't be a problem for me. <laughs> it was well worth the wait for Jim. Yeah, he's, he's just fantastic. He's amazing. <laughs> just such good fun. Barbara's saying you've got a lovely smile, tooth or no tooth. It should be very cool. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> that made me think though, Maggie. So with with that bit of work that you did with Jim, has that has it changed your audience? So you're thinking that actually this adaptive interaction is not just for people who are no longer verbal, but actually let's broaden that out and let's use it as a tool to enhance communication with people who have got some verbal or limited verbal. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's we've always had in the back of our minds that it could be used in another way for people who are still verbal. And I do have, and I'm not saying this, you'll invite me back again, but I do have another video of, of using something similar with someone um, and you hear how you speech and it's, it's about reflecting the words that she uses, even though I can't understand what she's trying to say. So use the words that she uses and the sounds that she uses. And it's the same approach, but it's just, it's it's fixed differently for people at different stages. So I do think it's possible to use the principles um, for people at different stages, yeah. And I'm gonna call that yet another conversation with Dr. Maggie <laughs> Ellis. <laughs> I've got it already. I've worked it out. <laughs> it, it looked incredibly playful, like what, what mm. he was doing. It looked like he was just having the best time ever. And it was it was play. It was, mm -hmm. you know, it was communicating, but it was fun. And he was yeah. taking the mickey as well, taking the mickey out of you. Completely, completely and utterly taking the mickey. And the fact that I had, you know, tried to pack up my stuff and, and leave, and he, he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, he did have a diagnosis of dementia and he, as I said he was almost completely blind and quite deaf as well um, and was very very isolated because of those sort of three things um, and for some reason this just spoke to him in a way that speech didn't. Um, he was a musician and he had a, a keyboard that would sit on, on the table that he was knocking on and he would occasionally play the keyboard and I did wonder um obviously you know this is just speculation but I did wonder if it was the musicality about the turn taking and the 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 banging sounds and the you know make it louder and quieter I, I did wonder if that was what appealed to him um but he, it was a game he, we were playing and I think we really fear that 
when we consider how we should be interacting with people with, with dementia. We fear that because we, we fear it will be infantilizing. And it didn't feel like that at all. And it's, it is, that was one of the thoughts that got into my head was, was he a drummer? So I hadn't thought was mm. he a but just the way that he could mm -hmm. like, you know, hold, held the beat. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, Right. Okay. That's enough for me shooting on. Now it's over to proper people to talk. Samantha <laughs> said, we tend to see dementia first rather than the person inside. The work with Jim proves that there's more to the person than dementia. Jim's character definitely came through. Your interaction with Jim was almost musical at some points. It mm -hmm. was lovely. Oh, oh thank you. That That's exactly how I feel about it. I do, I do feel it was, it was musical, you know, having, I, I was a long time ago a, a musician of sorts, um, if you call the bagpipes a musical instrument. And um, th there's lots of sort of turn taking and, and playing harmonies and things that you would do in a, in a pipe band. And it, it, it just, it really made me think of that um, relationship you have with, with other musicians in the band. There's give and take. Maggie, on a serious point, are you just dropping another hint that you want to do another webinar on the bagpipes? <laughs> oh, please, no, no. I couldn't do that anymore. I haven't played a set of pipes since I was 17, and that's not yesterday, so. <laughs> I just, I just thinking about the idea of play and, like, that it in, infantilises people, but we play, everybody plays. You know, we, we play from, from when we're little and we play all the way through our lives, and then yeah. suddenly there's this thought that, you know, if, if you have dementia, that that goes, that you don't want to be playful. And mm -hmm. what we saw with Jim is that he definitely wanted to be playful. Oh, absolutely. And I've, I've seen it with all of the participants that I've ever worked with um, as a volunteer or as a researcher. Um, you know, that is not something that leaves us either. We have this communicative repertoire that stays with us our whole lives. And amongst that is play it's still there and it's still very prominent. Um, it's really important that we allow people to engage in play. Um, because sometimes when we're thinking about, you know, whether something is age appropriate or not, maybe age appropriateness is not always appropriate. Mm. Um, you know, it's not really up to us to decide. Yeah. And, and play is such a big part of communication. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, as, as you saw with Jim and with Gisela, actually, um, you saw in that video that she was you know, doing things with her, uh, her hands and she was, she was doing this and what you couldn't see was me doing it as well. And then she would look away to see if I would follow her gaze and then look back and then laugh. When, when our eyes met again, I mean, it, that was play also. Uh, just a different style. Okay. Oh, Joy is on. Would any of this benefit younger people? I'm thinking younger people, younger people with a diagnosis of dementia, Joy, or younger people as in children. Will you just pop that clarification in? Barbara said. I noticed on the two videos at the beginning, the lady was positioned very differently. First, she was facing the wall and appeared to be trying to lift herself. And on the mm -hmm. second, she was facing you. Mm -hmm. Had she been, oh, had she been positioned like this or was that a result of your interaction with her? Did the different positions have a bearing on the success of the interaction? That's a really good question. Um, I've been asked that one a few times and the second video was her position positioning to herself like that. Um, so she moved towards me and closer to me and um, in the previous video she was very much back focused on herself on self stimulation and not really interested in me but this time she had she had taken my hand in that second interaction and positioned herself closer to me so yeah it's a great question because you do see on that first video she sort of looks she's interested when you come Mm -hmm. And then as soon as those questions start coming, that's when she's just like, yeah, very focused yeah. on her hand and looking away, from, not not yeah. at all. She's thinking, no, you're not gonna, you're not gonna bring me what I need. Yeah, I'm yeah. Myself. She almost looks suspicious of me, I think, in that video. And you know, I don't, I don't blame her. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Barbara said, what was Jim's background? And I feel like we probably talked a little bit about that, maybe that Jim was a musician. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's real. I really know very, very little about um, the participants. We, we ask for date of birth, uh, diagnosis, and um, any other health conditions, but we don't get to know the history uh, of the people, which is really sad. I mean, I really do think that's something that we will strive to do in the next project if we are allowed to access more information about the person from the family member, um, because the family members will be involved. I think it's important that we do know much more about the person than just those very basic details. Um, but I, I found out he was a musician because, because the keyboard was in his room and I asked the manager. Uh, Joyce, Joyce, come back. Um, it, yeah, so would, do you think adaptive interaction would benefit younger people with a diagnosis of dementia? Yeah, I, I don't think, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, older people. People with early onset dementia uh, could partake in this also. I have tried it with people with early onset dementia. Um, but again, it has to be, you know, you have to try and figure out if the person is at a stage at which it's appropriate to use just sounds and movements or if the person still has speech, do you use that also? Um, a lot of it is uh, a lot of observation before the session starts. So get to know the person as much as you can in their daily life, see what they do, what sort of actions they engage in, um, how they communicate, and then go into it that way. We don't just go into it, you know, just meet the person for the first time and that's it. So I do attempt to get to know them in some way. In the same way that you would if you were, you know, you're building a relationship, aren't you? So exactly. And trust. Yeah. Um, Debbie had asked, were you sticking your tongue out as well? You've answered that. Yes, you were sticking your yeah. tongue out. Um, Joy said, it's sad that this won't be available. Sorry, Joy, just add a little bit more in there because I didn't, I didn't read at what point you said that. So will you just add some more into that comment, please? Margaret, do you mix the media? So for example, say something and invite taps back as a response, knock three times on the table if you want tea, twice with the spoons if the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would love it if, it if it worked like that. Um, unfortunately, if the person is at a stage where they are not using speech, um, or as far as we can tell, understanding speech, encouraging someone to tell them what they want using that sort of system isn't going to work because they're not going to understand what you're asking them in the first place. Um, did I explain that well enough? Do you understand what I mean there? Yeah, and I, I wondered if if Margaret was sort of sort of thinking, you know, like you could sing that, couldn't you? So if if sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, if if speech isn't coming across as well, not mm -hmm. three times, I'm I'm not gonna start singing it, Margaret. I know that's why you put it on there, so I do, but I won't. Um <laughs> but you could almost sort of mix in song with mm -hmm. active interaction just to see how that would work for people. Yeah. Okay, so what I would do is use the sounds and movements produced by the person um, in the way that you in the way that they use them, but also try different modalities if there's no reaction or if there's no obvious reaction. So for example, if a person taps and I tap back, um, and we don't have this tongue taking thing happening, what I might do is try maybe tapping lightly on their hand or maybe making a scratching sound, but in using the same rhythm. And again, it's it's coming back to, to music again. Um, so yeah, we, we would try different modalities, absolutely. And um, Joy's added a little, a little bit. So I think Joy's thinking that if you don't use it with people when they're younger, mm -hmm. um, as you get to the stage when you need it, it probably isn't going to be available to us. Well, from what Maggie has, has shared, 
what Maggie hopes to do is get this training out to as many people as possible so that it is out there so that you know so the people who will be supporting folk with dementia when they're a little bit further on will have had this training and have this awareness mm -hmm. that's what that was my understanding Maggie of where yeah, absolutely heading. that's the plan <laughs> that's the plan but it's you know it it's a long it's it's a long process we've been doing this work for, for quite some time now and in order to do the research it needs to be funded um, so it's unfortunately communication and very advanced dementia is not necessarily at the top of the list of things to fund um, but the tide is changing somewhat I, I mean the fact that I got the the grant from the Life Changes Trust a couple of years ago, the fact that you guys have been in touch looking to do some work with us, um, it's all really encouraging that things are starting to shift a little bit and that communication is starting to be seen as something that's essential to the care of individuals with dementia rather than a sort of nice to have. Brilliant. And, and Joy's one of our colleagues in, in Salford, Maggie. Mm -hmm. So if if you if you ever need to have a conversation with Joy, she would be more than up for that, I'm sure. Um, to to, to support your research. Fantastic. Um, Thank you, Joy. And Liam has said, have you had any success with people that are moving? So pacing around a ward or corridor, or is it more successful when people are settled? I uh, I've <laughs> the other video I was gonna show you <laughs> uh, involves me pacing with a woman. Um, I know, I know, I can't help myself. Um, walking up and down uh, the care home with her, um, matching her pace and matching what she's doing um, with her hands. So she is tapping the handrail as she walks. So I'm doing the same. And she was just really tiring herself out this day. She was just so agitated and uh, she was just so intense um, walking backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards and talking to herself about something that none of us could really figure out what it was. But when she had someone walking beside her, keeping pace with her, um, showing that they were listening and understanding, or at least trying to understand, she eventually sat down and relaxed. And the two of us had a, a sort of a conversation uh, using her speech, her retained speech, um, and she really just completely calmed down uh, from the, the very agitated state that she had been in previously. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with hearing your words being said by someone else makes you feel as though you are being listened to. You know, it's one of the, it's, it's one of the basic skills that you're, that you're taught um, when you become a coach. You know, you reflect what the other person says, you reflect their bodily position, uh, their body language. It's, it's been it's taught for a reason. It's because it works and it's because we do it with each other all the time. Yeah. And Maggie, I've not, I've not, you know, missed the point that yet again, you've dropped. Do you want this as like a quarterly conversation with you? Is that what you're angling for? <laughs> One of these days, um, one of these days, I, I, I will come back. Um, I'd like to come back when I've got some sort of fresh video clips to show you, I think. Um, it would be really interesting to come back when I have video clips from the training project um, that will hopefully happen next year. But you know, you know me, I'll come back anytime. <laughs> And Joy, Joy said when I when I offered Joy up, um, she's come back and said yes. So she would definitely be up for having a conversation with Great. you. I look forward <laughs> to that, Joy. Okay, so we have um, a couple of minutes left. So if you have any more questions, then please send them over. Give you a second just to do that. We're thinking about like Jim. <laughs> I think I'm going to be thinking about Jim like for the rest of the day. But yeah, given that his like his hearing was going, his sight was going, and mm -hmm. he had dementia, then actually that sort of knocking mm -hmm. where he could lead it was a really mm -hmm. good way for him to communicate. Because we often get people who say, you know, you know, we talk about nonverbal, but then what's the point? 
in non-verbal where we're thinking that you can still see the other person and interact in that way it becomes yeah. really difficult, doesn't it so for Jim that was just a really good way to interact it was and to have um sort of a playful interaction with someone that doesn't involve you know do you want mushy peas or beans with your lunch you know it's, it's not something that was functional which is what you would have been used to um it's just someone having fun to have fun with um and he really he really took advantage of it um i think he could feel the vibrations as well because he would you know he would make it get much louder and then much much fainter and as you said you know he's completely taking the mickey out of me which i thoroughly enjoyed <laughs> That was brilliant. Right. Okay. I think that's that's it on our questions. Joy wants you to come back and do another talk. <laughs> well, I do have lots more videos, but <laughs> you and your video collection. No, <laughs> I know. I know. And when you know, if I do come back again, I'm sure I will at some point. Um, hopefully, I'll have a full set of nashers next time. Well, be more six year old. I've told you. Just <laughs> own it. Don't worry about it. Margaret said, yes, you should definitely come back. So Maggie, as always, it's been a delight. Um, Thanks for having me. This is like my this is like my ongoing personal development. This is my training. So I feel like an hour every couple of weeks with people. I'm like, this is amazing. That's my training done. Tick. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, we are we're having another conversation next week. We're having a conversation with Mr. Alzheimer's, which is a project that Joy led on in Salford. Mm -hmm. Um, she developed a little character called Mr. Alzheimer's that was a teddy. Um, we took it out into schools, we developed it, we wrote a story about it, we had volunteers making them, we engaged a whole host of schools who, and then the kids were taking home the little pack. So that is happening next week. So Joy, myself and another colleague, Amanda, will be on talking to you about that project. So we hope that you can join us. Maggie, once again, thank you very much. I hope that your dental treatment goes well. Me too. And take care. <laughs> I'm sure we'll see you very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure.